Ateneans, to ensure a smooth running webinar for both the speaker and the audience, please be reminded of these following house rules. Number one, for the entire duration of the webinar, kindly turn off or mute your microphone to avoid interrupting the presenter. Number two, be on time. Once you have joined the Zoom session, please refrain from leaving and attend the entire duration of the webinar. Number three, to raise your queries, you may type them in the chat box of the platform you are using. Kindly refrain from posting comments unrelated to the topic. Number four, the moderator will be acknowledging your questions and directing them to our speakers during the open forum. Number five, when participating in the open forum, be mindful of your background and your background noise. Number six, we will be releasing the link of the evaluation form at the end of the webinar. Number seven, please note that we will only be issuing e-certificates to those who have registered, confirmed attendance, and completely filled out the evaluation form. Number eight, use your real name and follow the prescribed format for proper documentation, if any. Number nine, unless you are permitted by the organizer, please do not record any part of the webinar. And number 10, please give us a week to prepare your e-certificate to be sent via email. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Recording in progress. Hello there Athenians, welcome to your chosen alternative class program or ACP webinar or workshop this semester. Let me refresh your memory on what ACP is all about. The ACP is conducted every semester to provide the college students with formative opportunities outside of their regular classroom routine or daily schedule in support of the university's uniquely Jesuit educational goals. Carefully selected resource speakers from different fields of specialization are invited to share their knowledge skills inspire students to nurture their personal development and partake in social advocacies or causes. For the third online ACP during this pandemic, we continue with the theme, Cannonballs, Firing Up Dreams, Courage, Action. This theme is inspired by the conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola founder of the Society of Jesus. Just as St. Ignatius was hit by a cannonball which altered his life and drew him to a greater calling, this ACP hopes to light up the university's call for students to have dreams, discern on how these dreams contribute to one's personal improvement and the common good, muster courage, and find ways to accomplish these dreams. To do this, ACP offerings are carefully chosen to be relevant to the current times, formative and mission-driven. The webinars and e-workshops hope to start a conversation on one's life in the pandemic, the changes and transitions, and important events like the national and local elections. The online sessions endeavor to facilitate personal and even community reflection and discernment. Who knows, these virtual activities could fire up meaningful cannonball moments in you, dear students. At the end of the webinars and e-workshops, the ACP hopes for the following objectives. First, acquire knowledge and or skills that are relevant to one's interest, talent, skill, passion, and advocacy. Second, 
relate or share the learning and insight gained from the topic or activity in conversation or dialogue and personal reflection. Third, examine the importance of one's interest, talent, skill, passion, and advocacy to the development of the society. And fourth, seek ways or opportunities by which the gained knowledge and skills can be further advanced and used for the benefit of the immediate organization, community, or larger society. Dream, have courage, take action. And don't forget to learn and have fun while we experience ACP Athenians. Drugs, terrorism, and disinformation. Three different things, but if we look very closely, we can see what they have in common. Aside from the fact that they are linked to criminal acts, these three, three things are also familiar or similar because there is an ongoing war against them. It is without a doubt that drugs, terrorism, and disinformation have negatively affected our society. And that is why policymakers and authorities established the urgency and need to wage war. But what if these ongoing wars become weaponized only to benefit the few? What if they lead to the abuse of power? Remember Kian de los Santos, the teenager who was an alleged drug runner and was gunned down during an anti-drug operation in 2017? What about Chad Book, a volunteer Luma teacher and was one of the new Bataan Five who were killed in an encounter with government troops earlier this year. Do these names ring a bell? Do we identify them as victims or just casualties of the war against drugs and terrorism? Who among you are familiar with Maria Reza, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate and Rappler CEO who was arrested because of a cyber libel case? It is impossible not to wonder, how do we determine if we are on the right side? Where do human rights fit in the picture of this war? Do human rights still even matter? Or is it just an abstract concept that hinders progress? Or so they say. So these questions are so heavy. So let's try to simplify everything that I have said by asking all of you this question. What first comes to mind when we hear the word human rights? So I want to hear your thoughts. Um, and you can actually give your answers by clicking the Mentimeter um, link that will be sent in our Zoom chat box um, by our one of our staff. We will also flash um, the Mentimeter code so you can just scan that and access, um, and access the site so you can give your answers. So, okay, it's now sent. Um, I want to see your answers. Um, again, the question is, what comes to mind when you hear um, the word 
human rights. So um, I really encourage everyone to give their answers so we can actually create the word cloud. You can also access um, the, the, min, the site by giving or entering this code that is also sent to our Zoom chat. So I, I can see someone's typing. See you guys. Um, I again, if you're having difficulties accessing, we have the link in our Zoom chat box, and we also have the code. So you can just um, so you can just um, enter the link. Uh, I mean the code. It's 4827771. Okay, I think I saw some um some of the answers. I think there was book. Um okay, it disappeared again. But I think I saw creative, um, freedom, morality. Okay, thank you so much. Um, for those who have entered their answers, we have protection, freedom, morality. Um, keep the answers coming, guys. So we also have, um, sorry, I can't, it's, we also have morality. Okay. So um, thank you so much, guys, for um, answering and for giving your answers. We have safety. Thank you so much um, to our participants. So um, that's our Mentimeter question. And I hope uh, it gives you an idea of what we are going to talk about um, in today's ACP session. So without further ado, Magis Afternoon Ateneans, I am Daniel N. Filio, a fourth year BS psychology student of the Ateneo de Nag University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this installment of the Alternative Class Program for this semester, entitled Human Rights in the Time of Wars on Drugs, Terrorism, and Disinformation. Before we start, I would just like to remind everyone here in our Zoom meet of the house rules. First, please mute your microphones in order to prevent distracting the speaker and your fellow participants. However, we highly encourage you to open your cameras if your internet, connect, uh, internet connection permits. Um, and second, if you have any questions or insights, feel free to send them um, by clicking this link or, and accomplish the Google form. So the Google form will be sent um, to our Zoom chat box. Just access that and you can ac accomplish the Google form so you can give your questions and insights. And of course, we will be reading them during the open forum. So I would like to mention that we are also live on the Adnu Osa YouTube channel. So to our YouTube viewers, hello there. Hello, and thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for partaking in this ACP session, even on a different platform. Please do not hesitate to send your questions or insights in the live chat, as we are also sure to also read them in, in the open forum later. So this ACP webinar will also be issuing e-certificates, but of course you need to stay throughout the whole event and accomplish the evaluation form that we will give at the end to, um, for you to be able to um, claim the e-certificate. So with all those preliminary reminders settled, may I now invite everyone to settle down and ask for our Lord's intercession through an opening prayer. prayer for our nation during the COVID-19 pandemic and the upcoming national and local elections. Almighty God, Lord of the universe and creator of everything, we come to you seeking your mercy, divine protection, and your will for us to confront the COVID-19 pandemic and the forthcoming national and local elections to choose the national and local leaders of our country. Merciful and compassionate Father, we confess our sins and we humbly come to you to find forgiveness and life. 
we come to you in our need, begging to halt the current COVID-19 pandemic. Healing for those afflicted. Strength, courage, competence, compassion, and protection to health workers who care for them. Eternal salvation and peace for those who die. And throughout this tribulation, may our families and communities be consoled and comforted by your merciful love. We pray that you guide the people tasked to find cures for this disease and to stem its transmission. Bless our efforts to use the medicine developed to end the pandemic in our country. We also pray that the forthcoming national and local elections may truly reflect your will, O Lord, who guides the destinies of nations. We beg you to deliver us, Lord, from coercion, intimidation, violence, and terrorism, from dishonesty, lies, and all distortion of truth, from bribery, graft, and all conspiracy for fraud, from gullibility to the deceptive and blindness of perspective, from threats, intimidation, and perverse language. Lord, our God, we beg you to give us the grace of a discerning heart in choosing the next set of national and local leaders in the forthcoming elections. Let our conscience be our ultimate norm. Let the common good be our highest goal. Let human dignity be respected all the time. Let the poor and the weak always have the priority. Let the care for creation be our utmost priority. Let solidarity guide the path of peace and development. Let genuine fear of God and love of neighbors guide those who seek public office. Shepherd of souls and savior of the nations, politics your gift to us, a call to serve others and grow in holiness. Guide our politics as you guide our lives. May our political engagement for voters and candidates bring glory to your loving name and help us grow in holiness. Grant all these through the intercession of Ina, our Blessed Mother, and our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Father Salerino Ignacio Reyes of the Society of Jesus for editing uh, the prayer and Jack Ivan Audal for the recording. Now proceeding to the highlight of this event, which is the talk proper, it is such an honor to introduce to all of you our esteemed resource speaker. So our resource speaker is a lawyer and he is part of the Free Legal Assistance Group or FLAG since 1990. Currently, he is an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines. Um, he graduated with a psychology and law degree from the UP and a master's in law from the Columbia University in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, our resource speaker for this ACP session is attorney Theodorte. Let us give him a warm round of virtual applause. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you, Danielle, for that uh, introduction. And I'm happy to be with you this afternoon. If you will give me maybe five seconds to just fix my slides. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. I hope you can see my slides. So good afternoon. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak this afternoon at your ACP sessions. And uh, I do not want to give a very long presentation. I prefer much to perhaps interact later on during the question and answer. But I hope to give some input on the topic that you have asked me to speak on, which is uh, basically human rights during this time of war, uh, relating specifically to three instances, the uh, terrorism, uh, drugs, as well as disinformation. 
I wanted to start with this photo. It, it's not mine. It is a photo that I picked up from, from media. Uh, and I wanted to use this photo to situate the short presentation I will be making. Because this photo tells us that things do not operate within a vacuum. Everything always works within what we call a context. Even for lawyers, and especially maybe even for lawyers, uh, law never operates within a vacuum. Law always operates within a specific reality, a specific context. And we need to understand the context uh, in order to understand uh, and learn not only how law operates, but also how you know, bigger, more important concepts such as justice, fairness, equality uh, operate. And so we start with that. We start with context. And uh, this quote from this author, Anatole Franz, is a really beautiful quote. And it speaks about a very important subject or topic. It speaks about equality. The law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg on the streets, and to steal bread. Devoid of context, this quote is beautiful. It purports to equalize relations. But again, devoid of context, it actually perpetuates an unequal relationship because it presupposes, it has for its premise that the actual state of things is equality and that therefore all that law should do is to operate as a neutral instrument, affecting both the rich and the poor in the same way. Fairness does not always mean equality. Fairness does not always mean neutrality. Fairness does, all, does not always mean that there is no quote-unquote bias, especially when the starting point is not equality in the first place. Justice does not always mean treating people in the same way, especially when the starting point is that they have not been treated in the same way in the first place. So justice and fairness cannot be neutral. Justice and fairness through a law, through a legal order, cannot be neutral. It cannot simply, as this quotation puts it, forbid both the rich and the poor to beg, to sleep under bridges, or to steal bread. Because the poor are already sleeping under bridges. They're already begging on the streets. And for some, they're already stealing bread. So the first realization really, if you want to understand how rights operate, how human rights operate within a time of war, is to understand that law and rights are not neutral instruments. They operate within this reality, this context that is far from neutral. Because law always distributes power. It always places burdens on people or peoples. And therefore, the starting point is never, never equality. So when a law or a legal order simply says, we want to achieve justice by making everything neutral, by applying the law in the same way, in the exact same way to everyone, then maybe the law does not help because the law is effectively perpetuating uh, the same inequality which started out, which was the starting point in the first place. Again, things cannot be simply treated in exactly the same way when the difference between the rich and the poor is that the poor are already sleeping under bridges. They're already begging on the streets and they're already stealing bread in order to survive. <clears throat> More specifically, and you may be familiar with this photo 
It is a photo by an award-winning journalist, Rafi Lerma. And this was a photo taken of an EJK victim during the, this administration's war on drugs. And I wanted to use this photo, which has been informally you know, dubbed as the Pieta, a modern day Pieta. If you're familiar with that, uh, with that uh, famous sculpture of Mother Mary cradling Jesus right after the crucifixion. I wanted to use this photo by Rafi Lerma, widely published uh, here and abroad, to demonstrate something that many lawyers uh, know but don't fully understand, and maybe ma many non-lawyers like you don't know. This famous justice of the Supreme Court of the United States wrote about this many years ago in 1881. He said, the life of the law has not been logic. It has been experience. What, he's, what he was saying is simply that you cannot simply understand the law by reading it. You have to experience it. You have to know how the law affects people. You have to know how the law takes from people at the same time gives to certain people. And so it is not simply saying that the law is nice. The law sounds good or the law is logical. The life of the law is not logic. It is experience. And he goes on to say that the law embodies the story of a nation's development through many centuries. It can, it can only be dealt, it cannot be dealt with rather, as if it contained only the axioms and corollaries of a book of mathematics. Those who are you know, good in numbers here, those who are math majors, engineering majors, statistics majors, for example, may look at you know, a problem and simply come up with a formula. And then they would solve the problem. What Holmes is reminding people, and lawyers particularly, is that the, the problems, the issues that law seeks to solve are rarely neatly solved by simply applying a formula. You cannot just simply apply a formula to a situation and expect the situation to be solved. For example, injustice. For example, inequality. For example, abuse of rights. For example, lack of dignity. For example, misogyny. For example, EJ case. For example, dictatorship. You cannot just simply come up with a formula, toss it at the problem, and expect that the problem will be solved. And so something that perhaps May, you may find strange for a lawyer to say is what many human rights lawyers and advocates have known all these years. What is legal is not always just. The law itself may not be helpful, as we said earlier. When we are seeking for justice, the law itself may be the source of injustice. What is legal is not always just. This is a photo of an actual uh, situation. This was taken, I think, just before the pandemic struck by a Filipino photographer uh, which, who contributed to the New York Times. This was, and this was... Uh, published in the New York Times. And this is a photo of Manila City Jail. There are rules, there are laws governing places of detention in the country. At the same time, there is a constitutional guarantee and it is something that you will see on the slide and it says the state values the dignity of every human person and guarantees full respect for human rights. Article 2, Section 11 of our Constitution. The dignity of every human person, yes, including those who are charged with very serious offenses, including those who are convicted of very serious crimes. The Constitution does not discriminate. The Constitution does not say 
The state values the dignity only of those who have not committed crimes or are not charged with very serious offenses. The Constitution says, the state values the dignity of every human person and guarantees full respect for human rights. And so simply by applying the law neutrally, as Anatole France would suggest, we will see how the context makes the law fall short. Because in such an undignified setting, certainly the rights of these people, though they may be facing very, very serious charges, very, very serious offenses, the rights of these people are clearly being disregarded. So let me talk to you about human rights. Let me talk to you about guarantees of freedoms and what the law and the constitution say about this. Our human rights are guaranteed by the constitution. They're also guaranteed by instruments outside of the constitution. The main guarantee for human rights is found in Article 3 of our Constitution, which is called the Bill of Rights. And if I may borrow, again, from a United States Supreme Court Justice, Justice Robert Jackson, <clears throat> in the case of West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, I wanted to talk about what the Bill of Rights actually is. And Justice Jackson, in a very famous quotation, which every law student knows, Justice Jackson says, the very purpose of a Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. One's right to life, liberty, and property, to free speech, a free press, freedom of worship, and assembly, and other fundamental rights may not be subjected to vote. They depend on the outcome of no elections. What was Justice Jackson saying here? He is simply saying that regardless of who sits, regardless of who is elected at a particular point in our history, the guarantee of rights under the Bill of Rights must be respected. You cannot vote out the Bill of Rights. It cannot become the subject of a political platform. All that a, you know, an aspirant for a public office can do in relation to the Bill of Rights is to simply say, I will obey it. I will respect it. And I will, in fact, fight for it. And so if you hear of people who think that just because they can get elected to office, that they can change, they can disregard the Bill of Rights, then you are talking about people who are violating your rights, your freedoms. They depend, our rights depend on the outcome of no elections. What are some of our most important rights? There are many rights in the Bill of Rights, and I hope you can get the chance to read the Bill of Rights. I hope you can get the chance to get a copy of the Constitution and see Article 3 for yourself. You, you can get it online. You can just simply Google it, the 1987 Constitution of the Philippines. You can go to Article 3, and you will see the guarantee of the rights and freedoms that are given to you. What are some of the more important rights? Section one, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the laws. It is the first guarantee, arguably the most important guarantee in the Bill of Rights life, liberty, or property without due process, equal protection of the laws. The second guarantee that I chose to highlight here, especially during this pandemic, is Section 11 of the Bill of Rights. Free access to the courts and quasi-judicial bodies, 
and adequate legal assistance shall not be denied to any person by reason of poverty. The guarantee here is the guarantee of access, of being able to avail of legal assistance, of the court system, of a lawyer. But the reality of, the, of this uh, guarantee is that because of poverty, many people are unable to afford a lawyer. Many people are unable to get a fair day in court. And so there is a need for us to make this guarantee more meaningful. Because again, a right without a remedy is no right at all. That is a fundamental principle in human rights. Where there is a right that is guaranteed, there must be a meaningful remedy provided. If the remedy is not provided or if the remedy provided is not meaningful, then it is as if there is no right. Every human has rights. In the words of the late former Senator Jose W. Jocno, Capete, to many, human rights are what make man human. You take away human rights, then you take away the essence of humanity. Every human has rights. And these rights are individual, meaning they pertain to each one of us as human beings. And they are also collective. As a country, as a free, sovereign country, we also have rights as a Philippine nation. And these rights are contained in specific instruments. And the characteristics of these rights are, they are universal. They apply to every person. As long as you're a human being, then these rights apply to you, regardless of your nationality, regardless of your citizenship. They're inalienable and immutable. They cannot be changed. They cannot be taken away from you. They are indivisible and interrelated. These rights are connected to each other. No state, no government can say, I will only recognize X number of rights, but not Y number of rights, because these rights are indivisible and they are also interrelated. The right to life, for example, does not only mean the right to exist. The right to life contemplates as well the right to make meaningful choices, the right to have privacy, the right to have food, the right to have water, the right to have shelter, the right to have a good quality of life, the right to have leisure the rights to all of these things. Because all of these contribute, for example, to right to have a good life. Indivisible and interrelated. They are also inherent. They do not need to be given to us. All that states can do is to recognize these rights. They are also protected. Again, not only the Constitution of the Philippines, but also international documents, of which the Philippines is a signatory. And then, as I mentioned earlier, they are enforceable, meaning each right that is guaranteed must have a meaningful remedy provided. What are some of the documents that would uh, protect human rights? The first would be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights the UDHR. The Philippines is one of the pioneer signatories to the UDHR. The UDHR contains 30 articles and covers the most fundamental rights and freedoms of people collectively and individually everywhere in the world. And, you know, if you, again, if you get a chance, look it up, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and you will see that the articles, the 30 articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights can actually be divided into you know, six, six main groups. Uh, the, the rights to, that uphold human dignity, for example, equality, the rights to life uh, the, or the rights to, of the individuals, the rights within a civil and political society, the spiritual and religious rights, 
uh, the social, economic, and cultural rights, and uh, you know uh, the the obligations of states to to respect these rights. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the main document. It's a primary human rights document that mo- almost every civilized society has recognized and considers binding upon them. But there are also two other documents that are important. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. These, the rights protected under the ICCPR include the right to life, to, to, to the freedom from torture, the right not to be enslaved, the rights to liberty and security of the person, rights of detainees, uh, freedom of movement, rights of aliens, equality, uh, the right to be presumed innocent, the right to be recognized as a person before the law, the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion, the right to express one's opinion without in- interference, the rights to assembly, freedom of association, the right to marry, children's rights, political participation, equality before the law, and protection of minorities. These are some of the rights that are incor- in, uh, interpret- uh, incorporated rather in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR. The other important document is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. These are collective rights, the rights of peoples, the right of self-determination, to freely pursue one's economic, social, and cultural development, to freely dispose of natural wealth, uh, equality between peoples in the enjoyment of these rights. These are some of the rights covered by the economic, social, and cultural rights, the right, the right to work, the right to just and safe working conditions, the right to join unions, form and join unions, the right to strike, the right to social security, the right to education. Uh, all of these are found in the International Covenant on Civil and uh, on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So these three documents are the main documents that protect, recognize, and enforce human rights. And the Philippines is, of course, a signatory to all these three documents. And so the Philippines is bound by these three documents. On a related development, if you're familiar with the Catholic Church's uh, social teaching, you will see that many of the Catholic social teachings actually intersect with the guarantee of rights uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the International Covenant on Social and Cultural Rights. So you have solidarity, workers' rights, human dignity, family, community participation, care for creation, concern for the poor, and rights and responsibilities. These are the, these are the planks, the aspects of Catholic social teaching. And so... I wanted to give that as a framework to talk about what you asked me to talk about. That we are at war. And that we have been at war for some time. But more particularly, we have been at war since 2016. It's not a war of our choosing, but it is a war that we have been placed into. During this this pandemic, during the long lockdown, we have seen also a continuation of that policy of war. It is a war against women. It is a war against truth. It is a war against the faithful and the faith. It is a war against dissent. It is a war against freedoms. It's a war against a way of life. What are some of the manifestations of this war? Early on during the pandemic, we saw a lock-up mentality. The policy was simply to detain people who violated, you know, uh, quarantine or minor regulations regarding curfew, for example. Of course, while we understand, uh, while we understand the need to protect people from COVID-19, we also know that there are many other ways of protecting people other than locking them up. As in fact, locking people up during a pandemic is probably the worst solution. Especially during a pandemic where the virus thrives on close contact. 
But we saw that, a lock-up mentality. We also saw the policy of red bagging, the policy of profiling, the policy of painting people in the worst possible light. This is a, this isn't a policy that started with this administration, but it's a policy that was maximized leverage and certainly weaponized during this administration. And we, we do know, and I hope you do know, the pernicious consequences of being read that. It is not only disastrous, destructive, catastrophic to one's reputation, it may be disastrous, destructive, catastrophic to one's existence, as there have been documented incidents of people who have been killed after being red tagged, among them lawyers. But certainly, that is part of the war that has been waged. There has been continuing impunity arising from the war on drugs, the so-called war on drugs, EJ case. Again, EJ case did not start during this administration, but certainly they multiplied, they increased. They were leveraged during this administration. What is impunity? Impunity is that state of confidence that arises when an offender knows that the law cannot touch him or touch her because the offender is well-connected, the offender is guaranteed protection, the offender is operating under orders, whichever the reasons are. Impunity reigns when that offender knows that the law cannot touch him, touch her. And we saw that. In the number of EJ case that were that mounted during this so-called war on drugs, there was also a war on truth, because many policies were opaque, were not transparent. Requests for information were, you know, were not given, were not given courts. The the truth could not be obtained. So there was a policy of opacity, not transparency. Especially during a pandemic, a policy of opacity is disastrous. Why? Because people need to know what is true. People need to know not only the what's, but also the why's. Why do I need to wear a face shield even when I'm already wearing a face mask? What is the scientific basis for wearing a face shield? Not what is the economic benefit to some of wearing a face shield? What is the state of the president's health? Those are some of the questions that were never answered, but were asked during this pandemic. It was also a war on truth. The mechanisms for transparency and truth-seeking were not active during this time. We have the Office of the Ombudsman, which is supposed to look into graft and corruption, which is supposed to look into irregularities in government. But these were not done. The offices that were supposed to find the truth and to push for transparency were in fact also silent and absolutely quiet during this time. There is also a policy of inequality. It's described by a phrase in a case, and a very old case of the Supreme Court, an uneven hand and an evil eye. Even when the law is good, but if it is employed, it is applied in an, with an uneven hand and an evil eye, then it results in inequality. Remember section one of article three, equal protection before the laws. 
And we saw that during this pandemic, that lesser known people, people who had no reputation, no connection, no riches, no name, no titles, who violated quarantine, who violated curfew, were locked up, who were arrested, were charged. But then you have people with titles, people with important government posts who violated the same quarantine rules, who violated the same curfew rules, violated the same regulations, and were never locked up. And an even hand and an evil eye. And finally, throughout it all, and perhaps maybe what may have caused all of these uh, aspects of this, all of these many wars, is the prevailing environment of disinformation. Again, a war on truth. Disinformation can be defined as content that is false, even if only partly true, that is deliberately crafted and disseminated to prejudice another. So there is nothing innocent about this information. By its very nature, this information is malicious. If the content is false, even if there is some grain of truth to it, and it is deliberately crafted, and then it is deliberately shared so that another person or persons can be prejudiced, then that is disinformation. We may need to distinguish it from two other types, misinformation and malinformation. Misinformation may allow for unintentional mistakes, inaccuracy in statistics, inaccuracy in captions, dates, translations, or when you know a satire is taken seriously. That's misinformation. So in terms of the level of falsity, then it is, on the, it is on one extreme. Maybe not as false. In terms of mal malice, then it is maybe not malicious or not as malicious. But then you have malinformation on the, other, on the other extreme, which is the deliberate publication of private information for personal or corporate rather than public interest. Revenge porn, for example. And I, I hear of many cases, especially during the pandemic of this. The deliberate change of context, date, or time of genuine content, which requires now this phenomenon called fact-checking. In terms of falsity, it's pretty high. In terms of intent to harm or malice, it's pretty high. And so in between this two extremes, misinformation and malinformation, is disinformation. Content that is deliberately manipulated. For example, audiovisual content, videos. It is intentionally created. Rumors, theories, conspiracy theories, deliberately spread with the intent to harm or to prejudice. We're facing a, an environment of disinformation. And it is one of the greatest threats that we have ever faced. Why? Because when people start to doubt everything, then nothing, nothing will be believed in. And people then tune out. Then people become apathetic. Then people stop trying to find out what is true. People stop reading. People stop learning, people stop asking. And the less we ask, then the farther away we are from finding the truth. The less we read, then the farther away we are from finding the truth. The less we try to stand up for the truth, the farther away we are from the truth. And why is the truth important? Because if it is an environment of disinformation that we are facing, then the only antidote to that is the truth. 
And we cannot have truth if we are unable to discover the facts. You may have heard earlier, you, you heard a reference to Maria Ressa. You may have heard her during her Nobel speech. If you haven't, you can Google it. She spoke about truth and facts. You can't have truth if you don't have facts. And you cannot have facts if you don't stand up for them, if you don't ask, if you don't read, if you don't research, if you tune out and simply accept everything and anything that is given to you, especially on social media, then you are farther away from the truth than you know. And this information is insidious. Why? Because again, it can come to us cloaked in many, many forms. It can come to us looking like the truth, right? Because again, it can be partly true. And so our, our response really, when we are faced with something that we read, is to ask, is to learn, is to find out is to be critical. That is, I think, what the Ateneo stands for, right? Magis, being better than everyone else. Being critical, finding out what is true and not stopping until we discover what is true. Okay, I'm about to end, and I don't want to end on that note, right? What can we do? What can be done? And I wanted to situate this presentation within the current uh, situation that we are in. We are not only in a time of elections, but we are in the season of Easter. where we celebrate where we celebrate the coming of the light the light that the darkness cannot cannot and has not overcome what can be done we can start by conquering the darkness it's a good reminder especially during easter Easter is a season of hope. And so, yes, elections are coming. In, in four days, we will vote. And so we vote with a hopeful heart, but we do not stop there. We also want to get involved, each of us. And I wanted to end with two reminders from another Jesuit, a, a more famous Jesuit. A good Catholic meddles in politics, offering the best of himself or herself so that those who govern can govern. But what is the best that we can offer to those who govern? Prayer. So yes, we do pray. We should pray for the elections, for our future, for the candidate that we hope will win and should win. But we do not stop there, right? Because as this famous Jesuit also reminds us, we must build the future. We must work for a better world. Do not be bystanders in life, he reminds. Get involved. Jesus was not a bystander, he said. He got involved. Immerse yourself in the reality of life as Jesus did. What can you do as young people, as students of the Ateneo? Get involved. Build the future. Work for a better world. Don't be bystanders. 
take a stand, fight for your stand, learn about what you can do. Your, your students then contribute as students. Contribute your intellect, contribute your time, contribute your talent, get involved. A good reminder by Pope Francis. And so I wanted to end by just simply using the words of Pope Francis here. Because in the end, this war will end. Not, just be, not because this administration will end, but because there will be people like you who will work for a better world, who will build the future, who will get involved, who will not be bystanders, who will immerse yourself in the reality of life as Athenians, as Filipinos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, attorney, um, for that very thought-provoking, very empowering, and very moving talk. Um, there are a few takeaways that I would just like to share. First, it's very important that we always start with context. Second, justice and fairness can never be neutral. And third, you cannot understand the law just by reading it. You need to experience how it affects other people and their lives. So um, I hope that this coming elections, we get to vote for people who value the truth and who also value for human rights. Thank you so much once again, um, attorney, for that, for that very empowering talk. So I am also sure that everyone had learned a lot about human, how human rights operate. Um, but before we proceed with the open forum, let us have a quick game. We highly encourage everyone to participate in this short segment because you will get the opportunity to win a prize. So the name of the game is Guess Me. Again, so here are the mechanics. First, a question will be flashed on the screen and the participants must guess what is being asked on the slide. So second, to identify the individual to guess, the person should type the code in the Zoom chat given by the game master, that is me, five seconds before answering the question. So wrong spelling must not be allowed. Um, anyone who types the correct code before anyone else does will have the turn to guess, and this should be done vocally by turning on the microphone. So you will be turning on your microphone after um, uh, sending the code. Uh, yes. So in case of a wrong answer, the next person who typed the correct code steals the chance to guess. So I think, are we all clear? Um, ready na po ba tayo? Can I see heart reacts um, to signify that we are all ready? So okay, there are five, six, seven hearts. Um, eight, nine, keep it coming guys. So again, I think we're all ready. So let's first have um, the code for the first question. So again. Kita type po natin yan and isa send para po kayo po mabigyan ng opportunity to answer. Okay, guys. Let me also um, have, while we're waiting, let me also um, remind our staff to um, check if there are already responses. Thank you. Ayan, guys, hashtag manindigan. Um, you can type the code and send it to the Zoom chat. Punahan po ito. And whoever um, types first or send the code first, um, you will be the one to answer the question. No worry, guys, this is actually easy. Kung nahihirapan ka, uh, kung magiging anxious kayo kung mahirap. If no one's going to send the code, I, I think, is it okay for um, our team to call participants? Ayan, we have our first um, participant that would be Desiree. Desiree, okay. I think it's Desiree. Ayan, thank you, Gwyneth, though, for sending. Okay, I think it's Desiree. Um, can we confirm po? 
Okay, Desiree, na it's na your time. Okay, confirmed. Um, Desiree, I would just like to um know if you're ready. Can you um turn on your mic? Yes, po. Yes. Okay. Hi, Dasri. How are you? Um, ready ka na ba sagutan ang unang question? Sagutin pa lang unang yes, question? Yes, po. Try lang po. <laughs> okay. Um, don't worry. This is actually easy. So, okay. We will now flash the next slide. Ayan. So, the question is, it is the universal standard that recognize and protect the beauty, uh, the dignity, sorry, of all human beings. So Desiree, um, you can give your answer. Right. Come again. Human rights. Okay, thank you. Human rights is the answer. Let's try to um, know if she got it right. Okay, tama ka Desiree. You, um, the answer is human rights. Very good. So, um, I think let's have Okay, congratulations, Desiree. Now, for for your prize, you will actually our staff will be sending you um, a message to actually ask for your um, for the details. So, thank you, Olet Desiree. Do you have anything to say before we proceed? Thank you so much, po, and thank you, din po, sa ating guest speaker for a very um, enlightening speech, po. Thank you, po. Thank you, Desiree, and congratulations once again. Um, to claim your prize, uh, the staff will send a message to you via Zoom chat box. So, yeah. Congratulations once again. At this juncture, we will now have our open forum. For your insights and questions to our resource speaker, you can send them to um, the Google form or the Google link that we actually sent in the Zoom chat box. And or you can give your comments or your questions um, in the live comment section of for our YouTube viewers. If you are in the Zoom meeting, you can also utilize the raise hand button um, or feature located at the bottom of your respective screens. So yan, sa, sana nakikita nyo guys. And then we will acknowledge you so that you can ask your question or give your insight yourselves. So as we wait for our participants, um, we'll give you time to send your insights and questions. Let us welcome Mr. Al, Fran Al Florence Albo a third year BS education, BS secondary education, um, ma major in social sciences student of the Ateneo de Naga University, our first reactor. Al? Hello, can I continue Hi, Al, yes, um, a little bit choppy, pero you're audible. Hello, Al. Okay, um, I think we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, let's try to move on first um, to our second reactor as Mr. Albo is um, fixing his um, mic. Um, let's welcome our, and let's listen to another reactor, Ms. Maria Bel Merano, a fourth year BS DevCom student, also of the Ateneo de Naga University. Mabel? Good afternoon po. Um, um, I audible po. Yes po, Mabel, you are audible. Um, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Attorney Ted, for your insightful talk. I truly appreciate the uh, when, when it comes to defining human rights, not just to uh, remind the students on how powerful it is, but it, but implying how. Human rights is an eye opener to us on what we, on what we can do, and I really appreciate that you emphasize that law distributes power and never inequality. And rights is not neutral in a sense that we live here in a society that um, even servants try to uh, really get that power uh, against the people, and the people are like suffering in terms of um, red tagging. 
uh, endless impunity, and again, war of truths. I remember the talk in Rappler. Um, there are instances that even our journalists uh, were tagged as the hashtag prostitutes because of the information being uh, relying to them against the trolls. And I really sense as a development communicator that working on ground is truly hard enough when it comes to, you know, giving uh, the community on what really talks about uh, the truth. And, you know, that social media nowadays are trying to battle out, alin po ba ang tama? And people would just say, tama yung information ko kasi reliable yung content na napanood ko. And I really, uh, and I really appreciate Attorney Ted on how you emphasize that hindi pa tapos yung laban. We are still, uh, there are national elections is coming up and alam ko, sabi nga, in a sense na trend na kabado bente when it comes to the election. But uh, we can do something about it and uh, giving truth is not about uh, um, having a reliable content or resources, but having the power to read, to uh, scrutinize and to understand the context of what it came from. And thank you po for the for the opportunity of uh, being with us in this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Dani, and thank you, Attorney Ted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Maria Bell, our first reactor for this session. Um, let's now have, I think Mr. Albo has already um, reconnected in our Zoom meet. So let's have Mr. Al Florence Albo for his reaction. Hello, to confirm if I, I'm on, am I audible? Hi, Al, you're now audible. Okay, thank you so much. So apologies for the disconnection. Uh, earlier, uh, before I want to start my reflection, I just want to thank you for meeting you there for what has been a very wonderful talk. Uh, I think it really emphasized the importance of human rights, especially that we're in the context of a war, the war of disinformation, uh, the war on drugs of this administration, and of course, uh, terrorism. So uh, for the interest that I have for this talk, I think I want to... I want to give focus first into the concept of legality. That sometimes being something being legal doesn't mean that it's just. So I think even the concept of legality or the concept of fairness in law is dependent to who makes the law and at the same time who enforces who enforces the law. So I think that's a very important factor that we have to consider, especially to interpreting what the law means for us. But at the same time, I think the other point that attorney that was I was able to wonder to space on the important elements of human rights is I want to focus on the important elements that I think are particularly important not only to the Philippine experience but I think also the experiences of other countries who are like uh, experiencing democratic time like uh, United States China or Russia as an example like uh, the concept of human rights being universal because we always constantly hear from authoritarian leaders that only a few people deserve human rights, that if you do a crime, your human rights is not anymore available for you, or the concept of it being inalienable and it also being parent comes from. So I think those are two important things that I think people need to understand about human rights, not only to be able to understand it, but at the same time, use this as an information or an important metric in making these important civic and political decisions, not only during elections, but I think the, the ability to protect human rights doesn't only end when you vote. It also comes with the form of protests, whether it's online or through physical means, and at the same time, being, being able to hear uh, dissent as well. But at the same time, I think of all the attacks that we've seen on human rights in the Philippines, I think the very big attack that we've seen on our rights is on the violation of, of in a line, people are looking for under society, which means that they are highly exposed to propaganda. And at the same time, you have the cases of learning attack on journalists and journalists. So it's May 5. If you can remember, it's been two years since ABS then was forced to shut down. But even the case of Maria Ressa, uh, of Trump up charges of libel, uh, of libel when she, when she was working for Rapid. And of course, you have the silencing of legitimate opposition that happened to Senator Lima and uh, Kia de los Santos and other human rights workers and, and 
uh, I think the key element here is that I think the 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 is that state forces are highly and at human rights in being watched being weaponized attention because of this situation. So I think it uh the 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 call for us to look first what human rights are. but at the same time what you what 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 does it mean when we protect uh protect human rights for people who are specifically marginalized poor uh individuals in the indigenous communities women and the lgbtq in general and i think this is a very important information that we have to take a look into especially if we're heading to the very crucial in a very uh very crucial election we're voting in three days so this is information that we have to really Hold on into that we choose leaders, not only national leaders, but even local leaders, from mayor to vice mayor, congressman or governor, vice mayor, who will ensure that our right to liberty, life and property, uh, property and safe and safe spaces, for example, are highly protected. So uh, I think those are my really solutions, and I think uh, people who are watching this on, on Zoom and YouTube, for example, are able to capture the essence and the importance of this. So once again, uh, my deepest gratitude to offer you that and to add no also to this approach. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Al, for your react, um, your reaction slash reflection. Um, perhaps attorney has something to say to our two reactors. Attorney. Um, but attorney, uh, I think you were. I think there was a, an internet connection problem. Um, that was our two reactor. That was our two reactors. So perhaps you have something to say, Paul, um, to them. Uh, no, thank you. I was able to catch uh, most of it. I, I think I only uh, got cut off during the last maybe few seconds of the last uh, intervener. So uh, no, thank you. I, I thank you. Those are very wonderful insights, and uh, thank you for thank you for them. Thank you so much, attorney. So now let's, um, at this point, we are now opening the floor to our participants and their questions and insights. So we actually have the first question here um, prepared. Um, what is your perspective on the servants who primarily who are primarily responsible to practice human right activ human rights activities for the people, yet use their power to violate those rights for their self interests? Um, again, what is your perspective on the public servants who primar who are primarily responsible who are primarily responsible to practice human rights, um, but yet uses their power to violate those rights for their self interests? Well, again, the, the principle really is that there really must be uh, a remedy for for any any violation, and so. If you're talking about public officers or employees who, you know, uh, as the question posed, who are supposed to guarantee, enforce, protect, promote uh, human rights, uh, but do not, but instead, you know, on the contrary, violate them, then, th then there really must be accountability. There really must be uh, uh, a, a way to make them accountable. Uh, and of course, the reality of the situation is that uh, if if those of those public servants, as as the question puts it, are you know are used or are are part of the weaponization of a particular administration, then the reality is that while the administration is there, then you know accountability will not be will not be uh, had. But again, you know. Uh, there will be there will be a time there will be a, a a season for accountability maybe not during this administration maybe during the next right and so uh but the, the important thing is that there must be an institutionalized way of making people accountable and included there would be not only the the government structures the government offices for example the courts or the ombudsman but also involvement of of this of citizens, for example, you know, uh, citizens coming forward to to document violations, that would help. 
in making these people accountable because many times when uh, when you know uh, when violators are 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 sought to be made accountable before the courts or before the ombudsman many times these measures fail not because they are they are not violators but because there is no evidence to show that they are they are violators and so you know there must be there must be also uh, an equal effort by by those whose rights have been violated to come forward to document to make sure that Uh, there is enough evidence to make them accountable, whether criminally, administratively, civilly, uh, and maybe not even not during this administration, but maybe after this administration. There, there has to be a time of reckoning. Otherwise, then we cannot say that these rights are being enforced. That these rights are being respected. So yes, uh, as a general, as a general rule. Uh, those who those who are found to have violated. Uh, these rights for example that government is supposed to guarantee and enforce and protect and defend must be held accountable by you know by by whatever means that the government or the laws will will provide whether it is through the courts to the ombudsman or through you know uh, or through similar means but there must be a reckoning thank you so much attorney um i personally agree for and i hope i do hope and i hope we all would be optimistic that that time of reckoning will come. So um, for the next question, um, attorney, I think do our laws um, are, do our laws um, comprehend enough or are, com- are comprehensive enough to strictly make those um, public servants um, accountable or be um, punished? Uh Well, if, if if the question is about uh, whether there are laws that would punish violators, yes, definitely there are. Uh, I think there are enough laws that would punish uh, offenders. The only question really is uh, enforcement. The only question really is ensuring that the institutions for accountability are you know are able to work. Uh, but that again, that also involves to a large extent uh, uh, the will to prosecute, the will to hold people accountable. And of course, many times, if the if the violators are part of the machinery of the state, uh, part of the you know the state policy to do a certain thing, then again, you do not expect the state to prosecute itself. And so, uh, you know. That may not happen within a particular time, but then definitely it should happen uh, soon or at uh, or at, at at a time afterwards. But so, uh, yeah, I mean, as as far as I'm concerned, there are enough laws. Uh, it's a question really of making those those laws work, or making sure that those laws are enforced. Thank you so much. Um, now, uh, also. Uh, related to that first um to the first two questions what is your advice um for individuals in the schools um which are unfairly red tagged and those who are harassed on social media because of political beliefs well again we start with making sure that if if for example any any recourse is going to be had that there will be basis so the first would really be to make sure that you know any violations are documented uh, and that you know uh, if there are witnesses that these witnesses are able to give their statements etc cetera, etc cetera. again the the uh, the the current situation might not allow for you know for effective remedies Against said tagging, but definitely this that situation will not be forever, and so there will be a time of reckoning. So maybe it will not be now, but maybe it will be later. But should it come, then definitely those who are uh, those who are have been violated, whose rights have been violated, must be ready. So uh, how how should they go about it? Make sure that they are able to document it. If it is on social media, then they should document what is written, what is said. 
if it has been you know orally transmitted meaning it is simply by word of mouth then again it must be documented by people who have heard it themselves personally uh they may of course you know ask ask the help of lawyers or paralegals in order to help them document but the important thing here is the understanding that uh you know it is a process it is a and as processes go uh it may take time and so it may not be the you know if 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 the the person goes to the courts uh the courts are not the the quickest uh recourse definitely and so the you know there is that there is that realization that it is a process but uh if it is important enough then you know that we must persevere through that process we must put our faith in that process because if that process is the only remedy that's given to us then we must make sure that we are able to make sure that the remedy works for us but if there is no remedy that is available then we must also ask for a remedy because again if there is a right there must be a remedy provided and that remedy must be meaningful otherwise the right was is effectively denied so yes um it really is a process and we should be very um we should really expect that it will take time so um for the next question attorney Um, coming from an anonymous sender, um, what is your advice for individuals? Uh, I, uh, what with the drug problem persisting? Sorry, that was already asked. Um, with the drug problem persisting, even after the killing of more than twelve thousand people in the campaign, this is um, during for the drug war. Are those deaths a measure of the drug war's effectiveness? It's uh, you know. Th- I I do not think that there has ever been a a victorious quote unquote war on drugs. The fact that it persists, the fact that the problem persists and continues to grow, uh, will show that you know a the 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 war approach on drugs really does not work. Uh, and so I think the the way to really look at the way to really look at the issue of the proliferation of illegal drugs is not simply to look at it as a law and order problem or a breakdown on discipline problem or you know to simply look at it as a war you know uh there must be a realization that the you know the the war on the the drug problem is not just a law enforcement problem it may not even be a law enforcement problem uh there are many reasons why there is uh there there is a problem with drugs there are economic reasons uh because there are people who patronize it and the, you know the, the the drugs sell and they they you know they they contribute economically to to many people and to many countries even and and you know there are uh, there are sociological issues involving the, the proliferation of drugs there are cultural issues relating to that and so you know it, it cannot just be you know it cannot just be a myopic view that by simply killing everyone involved in the proliferation of drugs or the use of drugs that it will stop uh you know that that is an experiment that has failed m- many years back and you know it repeating a failed experiment is you know is simply uh well crazy and so and and so i think the the perspective really there is to take a look at the issue of drugs uh from a wider lens uh i do not have the solutions to 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 the drug problem uh i you know i do not think i am qualified to do that but definitely i understand that you know it is not simply as simple as saying let's kill all the all those involved in drugs because again if you simply do that then you will just simply end up with mass graves but you know the the problem of drugs will continue uh if not here then in other in other places right and so so there really must be a broader a more imaginative uh you know a more comprehensive uh multidisciplinary approach to looking at drugs you must 
We must, for example, look at treatment. We must look at rehabilitation. We must look at supply and demand. We must look at enforcement. And yes, we must look at uh, law and order. You know, you mu- we must look at all of those. We must look at the economic uh, aspect of it. Look at the cultural aspect of it. You know, it's all of those. So, so uh, again, you know, it's not as simple as killing people. Uh, it's not sim- as sim- simple reason as tagging people and isolating people by, you know, by calling them drug addicts. It's not that. You know? And it certainly is, should not be as simple as, you know, making it a campaign issue. That just because saying, just by saying that one is uh, going to stop the drug problem, uh, you know, as a campaign platform is enough. No, because we have seen that it is not enough. Uh, the last six years have shown that it is not enough to simply be able to make speeches about the drug problem. <laughs> attorney so another question um is what happens to wrongfully de- detained victims of anti-drug campaigns and do they get compensation for being wrongfully convicted or detained well again there, there must be because there is a there is a process that is underway then wrongfully detained would mean that there must be a finding that the, the detention was wrong, that the detention was illegal, there was no basis. So there must be that finding. And upon that finding, there are there are remedies available. Uh, the remedies, uh, there. if I'm not mistaken, there are laws that provide for compensation. They are not, they are not very high, but there is that. No, but again, it depends on, it depends on a finding. It cannot just be, it cannot just simply be, you know, again, a, a, you know, a political battle cry because we are talking about a process. If someone has been charged, someone has been detained, then the courts have the responsibility to say if the detention is wrong and the charge is false, then the courts have the responsibility to say that because then that would afford that person who is wrongfully detained and falsely charged the, the, the remedy subsequent. To that detention and that uh, that uh, charge. Thank you. Um, now another question. Um, this is from a fourth year BS psychology student. What happens to wrongfully? Um, I with the drug problem. Sorry, this is from a BS engineering student. Um, rather, with the drug problem, um, pers- persisting. I, I think this was already asked, attorney. Sorry. Um, I think we now go to the last question, um, and this is just uh, this has just been recently sent by Sofia Pontanilla um, in our Zoom chat box. This is out of the topic question. What is the best characteristic of the president we should look for in this um, upcoming elections? Well. Voting for someone is a personal choice always, and therefore it reflects who you value, what you value, right? Uh, it's not it's not simply, you know, it's not simply a nice saying to say that, you know, your vote reflects your values, because it does. Uh, because, you, you know, you, you understand that when you vote for someone, you are empowering that person. You are telling that person or those persons that, you know, I, as a sovereign uh, citizen, I'm giving you this power to do these things, right? And so it is a personal choice. It depends on what you are, what you value, what your priorities are, what your dreams are uh, for for this country. Uh, and so. It, it should be something that you are, you know, are aware of already. Meaning, you know yourself. You should know yourself. You should know where you stand on values or issues or priorities, because that those are the things that should be top of your mind when you cast your vote. Whether the whether this vote is for president, vice president, senator member of the house, or even, you know, local councillors 
governor, mayor. Uh, and these values and priorities may differ according to the office that they that they would seek to occupy. So that's the first. You you need to understand yourself. You need to know yourself because your vote is a reflection of what you hold as important, what you value. Uh, second, of course, is you also need to know that the the people that you will be voting for, that you will be empowering to to into office, you know, uh, are are not perfect people. They are not saints. They are not perfect people, and so therefore they will they will have flaws. They have flaws. They have imperfections, and so it you know it it we cannot make it make this simply a, what a checklist and say uh, you know. I will only vote for these people if this person, if this person occupies all of these boxes. Because you will never have that, right? You will never have that. Uh, there will be specific people who, who are, you know, are important for a specific reason. And so, again, if you are looking for the perfect candidate or you're looking for a saint, then you will be disappointed because there are no saints in this campaign. There are no perfect candidates in this campaign. Instead, what you should be looking for is, again, someone whom you can empower, who will then use that power to make good for, you know, the, for a majority of the people who are in the same situation as you are, right? who desire the same change that you want desire the same things that you want. And so I think that should be the mindset when you're looking for candidates. Again, because we're not just voting for one person. We're voting for many, many people. And so that will really depend. You know? And then uh, maybe the last, and we've been talking about this throughout this session, uh, you want to look for someone who will not consider transparency, and accountability as a personal affront to them. Why? Because you are sovereign, not they. You are not electing royalty. We do not have kings. We do not have royalty here. We are electing, as again, many of you may have referenced, public servants into power. And so public servants must, must be accountable, must be transparent. And so if a public servant will take offense to accountability or transparency, then maybe that is not the public servant you want. If a public servant refuses, if an aspirant for public service refuses to be transparent, refuses to be accountable, then perhaps that is not the public servant we want or we need or we deserve, right? And how do we, how do we know that? Get involved. No, if there is, a, you know, if there's an occasion, find out, ask questions, attend forums. Well, there, there are only four days left, you know, uh, but, you know, engage in, in debate. There, is, there are still four days left. But again, you know, I think the, the important thing here is that we are not electing royalty and we should not treat them as royalty. Uh, they are, they are, they're holding themselves out as public servants, treat them as public servants. So, you know, one, one thing culturally that I think has been prevalent among us Filipinos and, you know, uh, may, may actually be problematic is, you know, we, we tend to look as public servants uh, in a very specific, really, actually, within a very specific relationship culturally. We call them by what? Tatay, nanay, ate, kuya. They are not, we do not elect parents. We do not elect siblings. Right? And so, yes, it is not wrong to contradict them if they are wrong. It is not wrong to demand accountability from them because that is precisely why they are there. We are the sovereign. That is what the Constitution says. Sovereignty resides in the people and all governmental authority emanates from them. Them there refers to us. We the people. And so, if again someone who aspires 
refuses to be transparent, refuses to be accountable, refuses to you know to to talk to you, refuses to disclose matters of public concern, then maybe that is not the public servant you should be putting in power, no matter who that person is, right? Thank you so much, attorney. Um, personally, um, attorney, I have been talking to a lot of people with regards to the elections. And I think when that resonates um, or that actually um, re is repeated, I think is with this is also with regards to human rights. I think they don't really, a lot of people still don't understand human rights because they see it as an abstract concept that, um, as I've said in the intro, um, it hinders progress. And I think it's sad um, how a lot of people view view uh, or perceive it in that way. So um, for, I think this will wrap up. I, although it, the, the election question was the last question that I said, um, I think uh, I would like to ask you, attorney, how do we, how do we um, convince them that human rights uh, is a very important um virtue or val uh, that we should value especially in the in um in the upcoming elections uh the only way to convince someone that something is important to them is to ask them to imagine what they would be if that were removed from them the reason why violations of rights remain to be abstract for people is because Many people do not think that their rights have been violated. They do not see it in the real terms. But, you know, if someone is prevented by government from speaking, by being censored, if someone is prevented from airing their petitions uh, and airing their grievances by government, if someone is persecuted simply by stating you know, an opposite view by government, then their rights have already been violated. Again, human rights are what make us human. Remove them and then they, we, we become less than human. So I think the, the best way to make people realize that is to help them realize what they would be if they were not allowed to speak their mind, if they were not allowed to gather, if they were not allowed to listen to the things they want to listen to by government. If they were told that by speaking out, they would be jailed or worse, killed. If they were told they could not, uh, they could not marry the person they wanted to marry because government says this has to be done, right? If they cannot, if they can not imagine, uh, you know, who they would be without those rights, then you would be able to convince them of the importance of fighting for rights, the rights of others. Uh, you know, it is, it is a tremendous privilege, I think, for us to, to be able to gather like this, uh, that we are still able to, to enjoy uh, our freedoms. But this occasion, this opportunity is born on the you know shoulders of the many people who fought who bled who died so that we can gather today and speak freely and that is that is something that people should understand why is it important to fight for your rights because if you cannot imagine a life without those rights then you should fight for them why is it important to fight for the rights of others because you and the other people and other people are connected. Our rights are connected. Our rights become meaningful because others can can enjoy their rights. Again, we are able to speak this way because many people before us, you know, uh, fought for this right, died for this right, and that and that is the reality. Thank you so much, um, attorney, for those wise words. Um, so I think that ends our open forum. Uh, thank you so much to our participants for taking part in this open forums. And thank you, attorney.
as much as we would like to accommodate all of the questions and um, uh, comments as well. I think, unfortunately, we have to end here. Um, but rest assured that we will relay your questions and insights to our resource speaker. Um, at this point, I would like to um, convey my heartfelt my heartfelt thanks to Attorney Theodorte for generously sharing his time and expertise for this ACP webinar. We actually saw that everyone has regarded this session um, as a great experience, as a great learning experience based on the engagements in the open forum. So to further show our gratitude to our resource speaker and his willingness to accept our invitation, we would like to present this certificate of appreciation. Um, citation reads, the Office of Student Affairs at Ateneo de Naga University presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Attorney Theodorte in grateful recognition of his expertise and service as resource speaker in the alternative class program, Human Rights in the Time of Wars on Drugs, Terrorism, and Disinformation, held on May 5, 2022. Given this fifth day of May 2022 at the Ateneo de Naga University, City of Naga, Philippines. Signed by Mr. Rodolfo S. B. Virtus Jr., Director of Student Affairs, Ms. Janet B. Badong Badilla, Executive Director of Mission and Identity, Dr. Alfredo C. Fabai, Vice President for Higher Education, and Father Roberto Ezequiel N. Rivera of the Society of Jesus, the University President. Thank you so much again, Attorney, for being part of this event. What a great honor and privilege it is for us, um, Athenians. Maraming salamat. Po. Thank you, my. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, uh, at this point as well, Attorney, we would like to request um a photo opportunity with you, po, um, as well with also with the participants. So, um, can I request the participants to please turn on your cameras so we will have this um photo up. Okay, I'm seeing um, a lot of our participants turning on their cameras. Um, we're also waiting for the others to turn on their cameras as well. Yeah. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So, okay, ready. I think ready na rin po ang ating tech, um, tech, com tech committee for the photo. Okay, so I we have four, I, we have eight pages attorney, so I think eight times po tayo magpipicture, okay lang po. Okay, thank you so much. So, Sir Vani, um, take it away. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, attorney. So um, to the participants um, of this ACP webinar, please do not forget to fill out the evaluation form that will be flashed on screen, and the link will also be posted or sent to the Zoom chat box. Um, please make sure that um, all the information uh, are correct so that it will also um, correctly ref uh, so so that the certificate will correctly um, reflect that information. Again, we are very grateful for the part for your participation and we hope to see you all in the future ACP webinars and workshops. Once again, my name is Daniel Filio, and this ends our ACP session human rights in the time of wars on drugs terrorism and disinformation. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and please stay safe. Recording stopped. Hontou ni kaisetsu na mono naraba. <laughs>